I know we're all a little flushed after that discussion of the romantic entanglements of Mexico and the U.S. economy. Um, now we're going to move on to the issue of competitiveness. And I think uh, this early session did a, did a great job of sort of framing the discussion, that, um, especially within the context here of our binational community. And for the second panel, we're going to blow your minds with um, the efficiency gains that we're going to find this morning in discussion with a couple of rock star economists who need no introduction. Um, I think in, in this conversation around NAFTA renegotiation and where the North American uh, economy goes from here, from this inflection point, I think it's important to sort of do a gut check. A lot of the conversation over the last six months has been around jobs and um, the effect of trade on jobs. And so today we have with us um, Lindsay Oldensky and Gordon Hansen who are going to spend a little time on the facts, giving us the sort of gut check on, in Lindsay's case, the relationship, the very complex relationship between um, outsourcing and co-production and jobs here in the United States, and looking at sort of foreign direct investment. And then Gordon is going to comment a bit on the prospects for trade going forward. He talked a bit in his opening about uh, being at this sort of important moment in looking at the future of the North American economy. And a lot of um, where we go from here has to do with how trade will evolve over the next decade. So I think it'll be a really, a really wonderful discussion. And without further ado, I think what we'll do is go ahead and turn it over to Lindsay. She's got a few slides. She'll walk through her argument. Gordon will follow with his presentation. And then we will open it up for a few questions from the audience. So Lindsay, with that. All right, um, I'd like to thank the organizers for having me here. I actually did my PhD in economics here at UC San Diego and was a student of Gordon's. So it's always nice to be back at the alma mater. And today I'll be talking about foreign direct investment by US firms in Mexico. So hopefully this discussion should flow nicely from the previous panel, uh, which talked a lot about co-production among the US and Mexico. And much of that happens within US multinational firms. So, for example, in 2014, affiliates of U.S. multinational firms in Mexico had uh, sales of almost $300 billion worth of goods and services and employed one and a half million workers in Mexico. And for some perspective, that's up from only about 32 billion sales and 55 or 550,000 workers in 1990. So while this was going on, at the same time, US manufacturing employment uh, has been falling dramatically. And a number of people, and including President Trump, have uh, linked these two things and said, well, you know, this, this offshoring by US firms, particularly to Mexico, but also to other countries, is responsible in some way for the decline in US manufacturing jobs. So what you can see here, the, the top line, the blue line there, shows the fall in um, US manufacturing employment over time. And it has been going down quite a bit. And there's a number of reasons for that. Technology, automation have been contributing factors. Um, also changes in demand. US consumers are just spending a larger share of their income on services rather than manufactured goods. And trade and offshoring have been named as well as uh, potential contributing factors. But if you look at the bottom line, if you look at the, the red line, that is the change in manufacturing employment at US multinational firms in the US. And that has not been falling nearly as quickly as overall US manufacturing employment. So if it really were the case that the fall in manufacturing employment overall was due to US firms just shifting jobs to Mexico or to somewhere else, then we, we wouldn't expect to see this. You would expect to see the multinational firms as the ones who, who were not employing workers in manufacturing in the US. And, and that's just not the case. And um, we also see, and I, and I don't have a slide on this because we have you know, such a limited amount of time, but you also see that within these US firms, employment tends to move together in the US and in Mexico. 
So you can imagine three, at least three possible scenarios or possible relationships between U.S. manufacturing employment and offshoring to, to Mexico. So the first case is the idea that these are substitutes. And these seem to be, you know, this is sort of the story that the administration and others have in mind when they, they look at it as a zero-sum game. Uh, the idea here is, you know, firms have a certain number of jobs that they have to do, and they can be done in the U.S. or they can be done in Mexico or, you know, in another country. And if you, you know, restrict offshoring, you don't allow firms to engage in these global value chains, then that's going to be a good thing for U.S. workers. That's a substitutes view. Um, it's also possible they could be unrelated. And finally, um, they, they could be complements. So we could see that expanding abroad makes U.S. companies more productive, leads to new sales opportunities. When, when costs do, go down, consumers can buy more of these goods, um, both more overall because they can afford more, uh, but also more of these products produced by the U.S. and, you know, or, you know as the case may be, by, by NAFTA, um, relative to goods produced in other countries or by firms that are headquartered in other countries. And uh, in this sense, production in the U.S. and in Mexico are, are complements, and they, they move together so that when multinational firms can take advantage of these, these global value chains and they can expand and sell more, uh, they can also hire more workers both in Mexico and in the U.S. And so um, what I'm going to talk about mostly today is some work that I've done for the Peterson Institute of International Economics, um, where I actually try to tease out some of these, these relationships. And it's difficult to do it with aggregate data. The aggregate data you know, that I, I showed you are suggestive that there's not a, a pure substitution effect there. Um, but that can be difficult, because there are many other things that influence that, uh, the number of macroeconomic factors, the recent global economic crisis, uh, the Mexican peso crisis. There's also a number of things like technology. There are idiosyncratic firm <laughs> things. There's you know characteristics of certain industries that, that really make it difficult to make any kind of conclusions or generalizations from the aggregate data. Um, so what I've done for the study for, for Peterson um, which you, you can look at if you're interested in um, more details. But just overall, um, we use firm-level data on all U.S. multinational organizations, so all of the firms that are headquartered in the U.S. and have foreign affiliates over a 20-year period and are able to use um, econometric methods to control for uh, macroeconomic factors and some, some idiosyncratic firm and, and industry level factors. And uh, what we find is that expansion abroad by U.S. firms actually helps um, employment at those firms in the U.S. Um, it also is associated with greater sales, greater capital investment, and greater R&D investments. So this is really the, the complementarities story that I find evidence for here, that um, when firms are able to take advantage of these value chains, they're able to become more productive, they're able to expand, um, and that, that helps them out both in their foreign locations and in their, their domestic U.S. locations. And I just want to um, caveat this, uh, first of all, just by saying that, you know, this doesn't mean that there are no negative effects. Certainly there are going to be individual plants that shut down as a result of this. And, and this is very real and this is very important. I don't want to diminish that um, with this limited amount of time. I can't go too much into the uh, distributional effects or, or in, inequality effects, regional effects, um, as much as I would like to. But I do want to acknowledge that you know, those are certainly there. Um, but there, there are other ways to deal with them aside from restricting trade, restricting trade, you know, both arms lengths and within firms. Um, so, you know, greater social safety nets, greater trade adjustment assistance, some of the things that, that have been mentioned by the previous panel um, are, are very relevant here. Um, but the important thing is that, that in aggregate, uh, we see these, these gains and the, this positive relationship. So what's, what's the magnitude? Um, so we've done this looking both at all foreign expansion by U.S. multinationals, so those are looking at all countries, but also specifically to Mexico. And so these numbers are specific for um, expansion in Mexico, uh, but, but they're similar for, for other countries as well. And we see that a 10% increase in employment at the foreign affiliates of U.S. firms in Mexico is associated with about a 4.1% increase 
in R&D spending in the U.S. by these same firms. So um, not only are they you know, expanding more domestically when they expand abroad, but it tends to be in high value activities in the U.S., like research and development that, that are high skilled, high, high value added. Um, also, U.S. sales increase, U.S. employment, uh, exports from the U.S., and, and capital investment in the U.S. So to think about these, these percentages in terms of numbers, uh, so the average U.S. firm in the sample employs more than 25,000 workers within the U.S., and the average max, uh, and they, that average firm employs um, about 1,311 workers in Mexico. So if you have a 10% increase in your employment in Mexico, that's 10% you know, of that uh, 1,311, that's about 131 new jobs in Mexico. When those are created, um, that is going to be associated with, um, from the previous slide, a 1.3% increase in U.S. employment. Um, and because the U.S. firms employ so many U.S. workers, that, that works out to about 330 U.S. jobs per firm. So if you prefer round numbers, um, basically for every 100 jobs created in Mexico, um, that's going to be associated with about 250 jobs in the U.S. And you know, keeping in mind, um, this is looking at just the direct relationship through multinational expansion abroad, right? Through increased um, hiring at foreign affiliates of these U.S. domestic firms, we have to keep in mind there are going to be other factors as well working in the opposite direction uh, for U.S. employment. So that includes, you know, technology is one of the biggest one, changes in demand, some some other factors. And so um, there may be, um, you know, these jobs created in the U.S. as a result of efficiencies from global value chains and expansion of multinational production. Um, and that, that might move in one direction, you know, is positive, but then you might have some offsetting effects moving in, in the opposite direction um, so that we don't actually see you know, aggregate expansions in multinational employment. But this is, you know, just the channel that goes through this multinational global value chain channel. So um, if we were to remove that, if it were to become more costly for firms to engage in, in these global value chains, then that, that would have a negative effect on U.S. employment, not, not the positive effect um, that is, you know, being alleged uh, in, by you know some members of the administration right now, but that, that would actually have a negative effect. That that would make things worse um, rather than better. Um, so uh, just to wrap up, um, you know we've seen yes, you know U.S. manufacturing employment has been going down a lot in recent years. At the same time, U.S. manufacturing productivity has been going up, but this is not because of you know, NAFTA or because of offshoring to Mexico. Um, and in fact, it's just, it's just the opposite, that the ability to offshore production in Mexico, the ability to take advantage of these, these global value chains has um, had a positive effect on US firms, domestic R&D, sales, capital expenditure, and employment. So you know, anything that's done that would you know, make it more costly to do this, um, in particular through weakening or, or even repealing of NAFTA, um, would actually have um, unanticipated negative effects on uh, US workers and US firms. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, and I think you sort of got right to the heart of um, what many people in the international trade space have been puzzled by, is the empirical argument for international trade seems like, seems like that fight was won a long time ago. But when it comes to jobs, if those negative effects of trade um, and those positive effects are geographically concentrated in different geographies within a country, then interesting things happen politically. So um, to move to Gordon now, I mean, we've, we've talked this morning about the, the um, North American sort of regional uh, economy and the regionalization of value chains and of um, production chains. And so moving forward, if we see this kind of large scale um, disruption of the North American regional value chain, what might, we, what might things look like for NAFTA? Uh, thanks to Lindsay for uh, uh, that great exposition on the way in which these value chains create deep integration between economies. 
And I'd like to just put a few facts on the table on what that means for what trade looks like right now and what it'll look like for trade going forward. Uh, and uh, what the work I'll present here uh, uh, is joint with uh, Danielle Leff, who's a PhD student here at, at UC San Diego. Um, we love to see our students succeed while they're here and to go off and do great things in their professions after they graduate. I want to open, though, by saying um, that NAFTA is a really personal thing to me. Uh, and that's because when 1989, I was a third year graduate student looking for a dissertation topic. My thesis advisor gave me $4,000 and sent me to Mexico and said, you find something to do. Uh, you know, it's the, you're, you're kind of spinning your wheels here. Go figure it out. Um, and I showed up in Mexico, and this was three years after Mexico had, had opened its economy to trade unilaterally. And I said, OK, I'm going to study the impact of, this, uh, of that trade opening on regional economies in Mexico. And um, he gave me enough money for the first three months. And he said, if you have ideas that are worth uh, uh, funding, uh, you'll find the money from somewhere. Um, but I'm not paying for the whole thing. You gotta, it, it's up to you. As a good parent does, you know, you've got to have some skin in the game. So as luck would have it, shortly after I arrived, the negotiations for NAFTA uh, were announced. Um, and I ended up in the office of the negotiating team uh, for NAFTA on the Mexican side under Herminio Blanco, uh, a team of uh, three stellar economists, Jaime Zabludowski, Israel Gutierrez, and Raul Ramos. And um, they said, we're hiring a bunch of economists to figure out what NAFTA is going to mean for North America. And I said, uh, great, because I'm kind of out of money and I need, I need a job um, and I have a dissertation to write. Um, and that's what got me started on trying to understand the North American uh, economic relationship. Um, I learned from my thesis advisors and I also learned from an exceptional team of, uh, of Mexican, U.S., and Canadian economists who are trying to understand what the trade agreement uh, would mean. It also gave, it, it had the unfortunate effect of giving me a completely distorted sense um, of how research impacts policymaking. Because what I saw was in the Mexican side was, well, if you want to make policy, what you do is you put a bunch of economists in the room, they come with the, with the ideas, and then the politicians go implement these things. I thought, this is great. This is why I became an economist, because all I, we, we, we produce the research, and it immediately goes into action. I came back to the US side of the border, and I, I discovered things are a little bit more, uh, more complicated. Um, but I want to put um, uh, just uh, three facts on the table. Um, First, uh, let's just kind of get a sense of what are the magnitudes of the economic relationship uh, right now. And this, it looks uh, different from where you sit. Um, so if we just take trade in North America as a share of GDP in the three respective economies, what you see is that it's, it's risen you know, unevenly but steadily uh, over time. Um, uh, that trade is about 23% uh, of Mexican GDP right now. Mexico is the smallest of the three economies, so trade in North America is going to look biggest from Mexico's perspective. Uh, it's about 18% of, of Canadian GDP, um, and it's about 4% of US GDP. That 4% may seem small, but the you US know, is, is a really big place, so that 4% is about a third of the, the total share of trade in, uh, uh, in US GDP. Um, so trade has become a fundamental part of what these economies are about. Uh, and it hasn't happened just because of this across-the-board increase in economic activity. It's, it's happened because of this deep economic integration we talked about in the first panel uh, and that Lin Lindsay uh, nicely discussed in, uh, in, in, her, discuss in her remarks. Um, and I want to just, and in order to quantify this, what we've done um, is to produce index of, of, uh, of trade competitiveness. So this is based on kind of standard metrics of revealed comparative advantage. Uh, and I'm not going to go through kind of how we calculate this stuff. Uh, I am going to plug something that the Center for U.S. Mexican Studies is going to do um, over the course of the, the, this next few months, which is uh, going to put together a NAFTA blog, which assembles what we know about the economics of NAFTA. Uh, and that will reflect, uh, that will incorporate research th uh, that has been done and put together um, nicely canned uh, presentations of the extent uh, of that trade. So uh, that, that deep inter uh, economic integration happens through the, the formation of these global production networks where the three countries get together and produce stuff. And the two most successful industries uh, in, in that domain uh, are motor vehicles and uh, commercial uh, aircraft. Um, and so here what I have are just kind of two slides which show you the, the revealed comparative advantage, so the competitiveness of North American economies relative well, let's just pick China um, as a comparator. 
Um, and you see China is kind of this flat, really small black line. Um, and the success of North America in automobiles and in aircraft has meant that China hasn't made inroads into these uh, industries. So to tell you kind of you know, how this works, just think of an example that we can draw from right down the road. Um, GTC Aerospace uh, Systems. They produce uh, engine parts for Pratt and Whitney engines that go into uh, Boeing uh, aircraft, into Bomb uh, Bombardier uh, aircraft, and involve production in all three countries. Um, you have metal that gets treated at a facility in Riverside. It's sent to San Isidro um, to, in preparation for shipment to Mexicali, where, a, fab, fa uh, where a, a factory turns that metal into engine parts, which are then sent on to a factory in Foley, Alabama, which are assembled into further uh, uh, subcomponents of, uh, of, of aircraft machine engines, which are then sent on to final assembly facilities for Boeing Air, uh, and Airbus, um, either in the, in the U.S., uh, in Europe, or for uh, Bombardier in, uh, uh, in Canada. So that deep economic integration means that production decisions that are happening in San Isidro are affecting employment in Riverside. They're uh, affecting employment uh, in Foley, Alabama. They're affecting employment in Everett, Washington. They're affecting employment um, uh, throughout Canada where commercial air aircraft production uh, happens. So that's th those two industries are a widely recognized and very successful example of the way in which deep economic integration can work. Um, here are two industries where it hasn't worked so well, um, but where the prospects for gains are very much on the table. So now let's look at a machinery and electronics. And China's rise in these industries looks fundamentally uh, different. China is now the leading exporter of uh, machinery and equipment and all sorts of electronics or products because of the way in which uh, production chains have shifted from uh, North America, really, uh, to Asia. So uh, we have in the United States latent potential to succeed in these industries that hasn't worked out. So think about what happens just here in our San Diego region. We have Qualcomm. Uh, Qualcomm develops the intellectual property that goes into chipsets that are used in, in a large fraction of electronic uh, devices that are used worldwide. We have electronics manufacturing capacity right across the border in Tijuana. But what we haven't seen is the creation of a North American uh, production chain in electronics in the same way we've done it in motor vehicles or commercial aircraft. So what should we be doing when it comes to talking about NAFTA? It should be talking about what do we need to do to make sure that the, the development of the electronics industry in North America looks like what happened in motor vehicles and commercial aircraft. Those should be the issues that are on the table. And that has to do with trade facilitation, with easing the movement of parts and components across borders. It has to do with coordinating the training of labor um, so that we have the right engineering uh, uh, personnel uh, in Mexico, in the United States, in Canada, who can uh, work together. So what at, is at stake here is if we look forward in time, um, is the, the amount of trade that's going to exist between these three economies. So to get a handle on this, um, what Danielle and I did was to take uh, off-the-shelf models of international trade. So this is the gravity model of trade. If you've ever taken one of my trade classes, I make you collect the data and estimate uh, these models. And what we can do with them is kind of run uh, an exercise which says, what does trade look like among North American economies if NAFTA continues to exist? And so if we have a trade agreement in place that fosters that deep economic integration. And as, as we has been nicely discussed this morning, this goes way beyond just lowering tariffs, right? This goes beyond, this goes to the point of creating uh, uh, industries that uh, trade components, trade intellectual property, and that closely coordinate on how goods are manufactured and distributed to the rest of the world. If we keep uh, NAFTA in place, so what you see is that trade between the US and Mexico, if we project out to 2050, is going to be around $2.6 trillion. Um, that's with NAFTA. Take NAFTA away. What happens? You wipe a trillion dollars in trade uh, off the table. So now let's look at uh, US-Canada. US-Canada growth is a little bit less dramatic. Why? 
because the U.S. and Canada are already pretty mature economies. Our long-run growth rates are kind of about 2%. So this comes to the advantage of having a young partner like Mexico in the relationship. Their long-run growth potential is, uh, is much more uh, substantial. So if we look at, uh, uh, if we look at U.S.-Canada trade with NAFTA, we're going to be a little over uh, $2 trillion. Uh, we take away NAFTA. We wipe away about $500 billion uh, in trade. So this is the choice that we face. Um, we want to get rid of NAFTA. We can do it. We can do it really easily. And what you're going to do is you're going to wipe out a trillion dollars in future trade between the U.S. and Mexico, a half a trillion dollars in future trade uh, between the U.S. and Canada, uh, and about $100 billion in future trade between Canada uh, and Mexico. Or we can think about how we've used what we've done in creating production networks in automobiles and in aircraft uh, so successfully to take advantages of the opportunities that are sitting on the table um, uh, with regards to electronics, uh, with regards to machinery and equipment, and with regards to the tremendous opportunity that trade and services uh, present for us. And the choice is pretty stark. We can go uh, two very different directions uh, right now. Um, and what we hope to do and what we're going to be doing here at UC San Diego in the months that come uh, with our, our many partners in the community and our partners in Mexico uh, and in Canada is be, to be trying to put facts and figures on the table that inspire uh, a reasoned um, a debate that's firmly based on what the economics uh, of the North American relationship has been uh, to date. Thank you very much.